make sure your PCR based cloning is dependable. Make sure you've DPN'd it. So, DPN1 digest is a way that we can basically get rid of the template plasmid that we're using when we're doing PCR based cloning. And I'll go over what all this means, but basically, we can take advantage of the fact that when bacteria copy DNA, they do it slightly, they add a modification on it that doesn't get added when we copy DNA in a test tube using PCR. So when we're using PCR to make um, different clones from a plasmid or to make changes to the plasmid with mutagenesis, we have to make sure that we can get rid of that template that we used and DPN1 allows us to do this by using a restriction enzyme called DPN1 to that actually chews up methylated DNA. So methyl is that modification that the bacteria add when they copy their DNA that we don't add, what doesn't get added in our PCR methods. So the template's going to be methylated, our plasmid is not, and we can then take advantage of DP, use DPN1 to chew up the parent plasmid so that we only stick into bacteria the plasmid that we made, not the plasmid that we made what we made from. So here's all those details I promised. In molecular cloning, we can kind of design these circular pieces of DNA called plasmids that we stick into bacteria and get the bacteria to make lots of copies of it. There are different ways in which we can design and modify these plasmids, and some of them are based on PCR, which is where we make copies of DNA in a test tube using a template. And in the case of PCR-based cloning methods, whether it's something like SLIC, where we're adding, um, where we might be inserting a new insert um, into a vector, so we typically call a vector like a vehicle, so we can think of the plasmid being the circular piece of DNA, and the vector, you can kind of think of it as being sort of like the backbone, um, although we typically often use the term vector and plasmid interchangeably, and I probably will. We can use techniques to kind of like swap out what is in the plasmid, so kind of like what gene do we have in there, or we can use techniques like quick change or other, um, we can also use slick for like mutagenesis in order to make specific changes to our plasmid. In both of these cases, we're relying on the template being used to make as a we're relying on the vector it being used as a template for making lots of copies of the plasmid. And we want to select for make sure that we're only allowing to grow the plasmid that actually has those changes that we want, and not just the parent vector, the plasmid that we're using as a template for making these. This can be a challenge because the plasmid is actually going to have the part that we use in order to select for which bacteria actually take in the plasmid during the transformation step, where we basically do something like heat shock to make it so that the bacteria take in the plasmid. We then use antibiotic selection typically in order to we grow the bacteria on um, in food that is spiked with the anti with an antibiotic, and this and the plasmid has a matching antibiotic resistance gene. So if the cells take in the plasmid with the antibiotic resistance gene, then they're going to be able to survive. But because this antibiotic resistance gene is on the plasmid vector, it's on the backbone part, not in the part that you modified. Well, now you don't know if you're selecting for cells that have the parents or cells that have what you want. In order to make it so that the cells only can, the cells don't just take in the parent, but they actually have the plasmid that you think you cloned, we can use a DPN1 digest, which takes advantage of differences between how DNA is copied in bacteria and in a test tube. The actual physical process works really similarly in that you unzip the strands of DNA and you use one strand as a template for making a copy of the other strands. But what happens when bacteria do it is that they actually add an extra mark. In PCR and in the bacterial replication, where basically they're copying their DNA before they divide. And I should say that here we're talking about the plasma being copied um, and not just, um, and as well as the bacteria's own DNA, it copies them both before it divides, then it passes them on. It does this using DNA polymerase. And in our PCR, we use DNA polymerase in order to make the copies as well. And DNA polymerase can make a copy of one strand based on another strand, thanks to the base pair and complementarity. But what it can't do is it can't add extra marks. And in bacteria, they do add extra marks. There's a modifier called DAM methyltransferase. And what it does is it travels along behind DNA polymerase and it adds a methyl mark, this like CH3 group. 
And but there's going to be a lag between when the when the new strand is synthesized and so when the T, when the polymerase comes along and comes through and when dam comes along. And this is going to offer a bit of a lag where you have the old strand be methylated and the new strand is not methylated. So you're in this hemimethylated straight state where you have one strand methylated but not the other. And this state allows a short period where the cell can distinguish between what was the old strand and what was the new strand. And this is long enough that if there was a mistake in the copying, the bacterial fixing machinery, the mismatch repair machinery, when it comes to kind of fix things, it can know which strand was the original strand and therefore it'll change the other strand to match the original strands. And then dam methyl transferase comes along and it adds the methyl mark and the strands look identical. So basically this dam is going to be really promiscuous and it's going to methylate every time it sees an A and a GATC sequence. And so you end up with this extensively methylated DNA when the bacteria make their own DNA, when, when they copy their own DNA. So if you're growing a plasmid in bacteria and the bacteria is making lots of copies of it, those copies are going to end up being methylated. But if you're doing some sort of PCR-based cloning method, well, now those copies that you make with PCR, they're not going to be methylated because there's not going to be the methyl transferase in your PCR reaction mix. So now we just need a way to like physically distinguish between these two because we can't see those methyl marks, but we can use molecules that can see the methyl marks and that will selectively degrade the methylated DNA. For this, we turn to a bacteria called Streptococcus pneumoniae um, and its restriction enzyme, DPM1. So its restriction enzyme is a um, site sequence specific endonuclease. Um, and so basically these are enzymes, these are reaction helper mediators that recognize specific DNA sequences and cut them. And DPN1 is kind of like promiscuous in that it's not too picky about what sequences it cuts, but it only cuts methylated DNA. And so it's going to come in and it's going to, if the DNA is methylated, it's going to chop it up. And it's going to, the only methylated DNA is going to be the parent. And so this way you can selectively degrade the parent. And then when you go and you transform this plasmid into cells, so you stick it into cells. Now, the pl parent plasmid should have been destroyed. And so all the plasmid that's in there should be like all the intact plasmid that has the insert in that has the antibiotic resistance gene should hopefully also have your insert or whatever modifications you made. And then you can use the antibi rely on that antibiotic selection in order to select for those with your plasmid. Of course, this is only going to kind of, there's, it's not totally perfect. You want to do, typically you do like a DPN1 digestion for um, somewhere around like three hours or so. I tip it, I often have better luck if you actually do it overnight. You can do this at 37 degrees Celsius, just like stick it in one of your plate incubators um, and it seems to work well. In order to get an idea about how much of the parent to expect, you can do a control where you DPN1 digest the parent, but you don't do any of the mutagenesis. You don't do any of your PCR stuff. You just take that plasmid and you digest the same amount that's in your reaction. You DPN1 digest it and then you transform it into the cells. So this is typically you trans you're transforming with heat shock or something. And then you see how many colonies you get. And this should be your background telling you about how well the DPN1 digest worked and what, you, what level of colonies you would expect if your cloning was not success, even if your cloning wasn't successful. And so typically there's going to be some amount of parent left over. And even of those plasmids that aren't the parent, there's going to often be typos or mistakes with the cloning methods. And so not all of the colonies are actually going to have what you want. The only way to know for sure whether the colonies have what you want is to send them for sequencing. But this requires you growing up the cells, you doing PC. Um, mini preps and then you're sending it for sequencing and waiting for the sequencing results. So there are some quicker methods that we can often use when we're cloning to kind of get an idea whether it probably worked. But these, are, these techniques may or may not work when you're doing some sort of PCR-based method. These, met these kind of like quick check methods include colony PCR and analytical digest, which I've talked about in other posts.
With colony PCR, you basically run a PCR. You don't even have to purify things out. You can just use it based on the single colony. Um, just kind of take a little, take a toothpick or a pipette tip, take a little bit, swirl it around in your PCR mix um, and run directly on that. Now, if you use it, P, colony PCR, you want to make sure that you're using insert specific primers or one that's in the insert and one that's in the vector. But you don't want to just use vector specific primers because as, as long as your insert is of a similar size or if your modification is just changing a single site, then you're not going to see any difference in the size of the bands, whether or not the insert is there. If you use an insert specific primer, you're gonna to need to make sure that it's specific to the changed insert and it's not in a part that's shared between the parent and the changed insert. Um, so if you're just changing a single site, you might not be able to do this just by, um, because the primers are still like misbind and things. So colony PCR may or may not be an option for you if you're using a PCR based cloning method. Analytical digest also may or may not work. Analytical digestion, you're basically using restriction enzymes, but more sequence specific ones, this is not having anything to do with the methylation, um, but it just recognizes specific sequences. So you can add these enzymes that recognize specific sequences, get them to cut the plasmid, and then see what size the cut pieces are, and whether the size of the pieces and the number of pieces is going to depend on whether that sequence is present and how many times, which will depend on whether or not your cloning worked, as long as you de designed this experiment correctly. This may or may not work, um, depending on whether or not you are inserting a new sequence. So you can get it to work if your insert or if your metagenesis introduces or removes a cut site for a restriction enzyme. But if you're not changing the restriction enzyme cut sites, you're not going to see a difference in your analytical digest. But you can do things like introduce silent mutations to make it so that you can tell if your cloning worked based on analytical digest. Of course, this is just kind of like telling you it probably worked. There could be typos other else places. Really, you're going to be relying mostly on sequencing. Um, so using sequencing in order to tell if your, if your cloning worked and much more on this in another post. But because remember that the plasmid, it's this antibiotic resistance gene that's going to dictate whether or not the cells are going to be, the bacteria is going to be able to grow. And this is on the parent vector. So it makes it extra, extra important to destroy this plasma, this parent vector in the case of these PCR-based cloning, because this is going to then be the majority of your clones unless you DP01 treat it, because these clones with this plasma that they don't even have to fix, it's just pre-made for them, and it's going to be kind of like, um, it'll be super coiled, so it'll be coiled up really tightly and it's going to transform more easily and it has a bunch of different benefits over the clone, the plasma that you were trying to clone. So DPN1 digestion is going to destroy that plasmid so we don't have to worry about that. If you are familiar with restriction enzymes, this DPN1 might seem kind of weird for you. So restriction enzymes and methyl transferases typically work as part of like bacteria and phage um, combat. So phages are, or is short for bacteriophage and they're viruses that infect bacteria. And typically bacteria and phages are in a sort of arm, molecular arms race where the bacteria are trying to protect themselves from the phages. And what these phages do is they kind of like dock onto the bacteria and they inject their DNA and they use the bacteria to make lots of copies of them. If the bacteria can recognize that the phage DNA that gets inserted is foreign, then they can destroy that phage DNA before it, before it kind of like takes over their cells. And one of the ways that they do this is using restriction endonucleases and methyl transferases as part of like an RM system, restriction modification system. Basically, they have restriction endonucleases or these restriction enzymes, these REases, that are going to recognize specific sequences and then cut those sequences. And so they try to keep those sequences out of their own DNA so that they don't have to worry about cutting their own DNA. And therefore, if these restriction enzymes find this DNA sequence, it means some for it's in some foreigner. If this is a really specific site, then this can be useful, but the phages can get tricky and they can actually make it so that they don't have those sites. 
So bacteria can have restriction enzymes that are going to recognize kind of more generic sites, but then it can be hard to keep those generic sites out of their own DNA. And so what they do is they're going to actually methylate their own DNA in order to protect it so that the bacteria, the restriction enzymes don't kind of like recognize it and so they're not going to cut it. This can um, sometimes interfere with some of the restriction enzymes we want to use in the lab. So just um, be wary of that because what can happen is that the methylation is going to hide the sites for the restriction enzymes. But in the case of this DPN1, we kind of have the opposite situation. We have a case where the phages kind of get tricky and so they start methylating their own DNA to kind of look like bacterial DNA. And this makes it harder for the bacteria to recognize which DNA is the phages and which DNA is theirs. So there's actually a, the GPN1, it, it kind of, it recognizes the methylated DNA. So now the bacteria in these strains, they don't methylate their own DNA with this dam, but the phages, they are methylating their DNA. And so now the bacterial DNA will be unmethylated and the phage DNA will be methylated. Now, this is just in these DAM minus strains. And so typically when you're working with them, the lab is going to be a DAM plus strain. So you are going to get that you are going to get that methylation, which is going to make it useful for cloning. When we're talking about not being methylated, we're talking about just in the case of certain bacteria, including the streptococcus pneumoniae, in which we've taken the DPN1 out of. So we're able to use a DPN1 to selectively degrade the parent plasmid, um, but it acts in a sort of opposite way than you would typically expect for an RE syst on our own system. So it's pretty cool science. So just to review, when you're using a PCR-based cloning method, you're making changes to a parent plasmid that already contains the antibiotic selection marker. Because your parent plasmid contains a selection marker, it's going to be allowed to grow in bacteria, whether or not you've made the changes to it that you want to make. And it's typically going to have a growth advantage if you haven't made those changes. So we need to destroy this parent vector before we stick this plasmid into the cells. And when we do that, we can do this using DPN1. DPN1 is going to take advantage of the fact that when bacteria copy their DNA, they add modification called methylation. And this methylation, um, methylated DNA is going to act as a substrate or basically it's going to be able to be acted upon by DPN1. And DPN1 is going to be a restriction enzyme that specifically chews up methylated DNA. We can add DPN1 to our plasmid after we do our cloning stuff. And this is going to basically destroy any of the parent template that's left over. And now only um, the modified template, the modified plasmid should be left over. And we can now transform that modified plasmid into bacteria. So stick it into bacteria. And now we don't have to worry about the plasmid being selected for. Instead, we can just um, mostly, most hopefully, um, as long as the DPN1 worked, we should be only selecting for the plasmid that actually has our insert or has its has the mutation that we wanted. But to be sure, you'll want to then um, do sequencing to make sure that you actually did make those changes that you wanted to make. The DPN1 makes it much more likely that those clones that you isolate and send for sequencing are actually going to have the changes that you want and not just be your parent plasmid. So hope that helps you understand DPN1 digestion.